Prologue. Terrified. Computers seem to be getting smarter at an alarming rate. But one thing they still can't do is appreciate irony. That's what was on my mind a few years ago when, on my way to a discussion about artificial intelligence, or AI, I got lost in the capital of searching and finding. The Googleplex, Google's world headquarters in Mountain View, California. What's more, I was lost inside the Google Maps building. Irony squared. The Maps building itself had been easy to find. A Google Street View car was parked by the front door. A hulking appendage crowned by a red and black soccer ball of a camera sticking up from its roof. However, once inside, with my prominent visitor badge assigned by security, I wandered, embarrassed, among warrens of cubicles occupied by packs of Google workers, headphones over ears, intently typing on Apple desktops. After some mapless random search, I finally found the conference room assigned for the day-long meeting and joined the group gathered there. The meeting, in May 2014, had been organized by Blaise Aguera y Arcas, a young computer scientist who had recently left a top position at Microsoft to help lead Google's machine intelligence effort. Google started out in 1998 with one product, a website that used a novel, extraordinarily successful method for searching the web. Over the years, Google has evolved into the world's most important tech company and now offers a vast array of products and services, including Gmail, Google Docs, Google Translate, YouTube, Android, many more that you might use every day, and some that you've likely never heard of. Google's founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, have long been motivated by the idea of creating artificial intelligence in computers, and this quest has become a major focus at Google. In the last decade, the company has hired a profusion of AI experts, most notably Ray Kurzweil, a well-known inventor and a controversial futurist who promotes the idea of an AI singularity, a time in the near future when computers will become smarter than humans. Google hired Kurzweil to help realize this vision. In 2011, Google created an internal AI research group called Google Brain. Since then, the company has also acquired an impressive array of AI startup companies with equally optimistic names, Applied Semantics, Deep Mind, and Vision Factory, among others. In short, Google is no longer merely a web search portal, not by a long shot. It is rapidly becoming an applied AI company. AI is the glue that unifies the diverse products, services, and blue sky research efforts offered by Google and its parent company, Alphabet. The company's ultimate aspiration is reflected in the original mission statement of its deep mind group. Solve intelligence and use it to solve everything else. AI and GEB I was pretty excited to attend an AI meeting at Google. I had been working on various aspects of AI since graduate school in the 1980s and had been tremendously impressed by what Google had accomplished. I also thought I had some good ideas to contribute. But I have to admit that I was there only as a tag along. The meeting was happening so that a group of select Google AI researchers could hear from and converse with Douglas Hofstadter, a legend in AI, and the author of a famous book cryptically titled Gödel Escher Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid, or more succinctly, GEB. If you're a computer scientist or a computer enthusiast, it's likely you've heard of it, or read it, or tried to read it. Written in the 1970s, GEB was an outpouring of Hofstadter's many intellectual passions, mathematics, art, music, language, humor, and wordplay all brought together to address the deep questions of how intelligence, consciousness, and the sense of self-awareness that each human experiences so fundamentally can emerge from the non-intelligent, non-conscious substrate of biological cells. 
It's also about how intelligence and self-awareness might eventually be attained by computers. It's a unique book. I don't know of any other book remotely like it. It's not an easy read, and yet it became a bestseller and won both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. Without a doubt, GEB inspired more young people to pursue AI than any other book. I was one of those young people. In the early 1980s, after graduating from college with a math degree, I was living in New York City, teaching math in a prep school, unhappy and casting about for what I really wanted to do in life. I discovered GEB after reading a rave review in Scientific American. I went out and bought the book immediately. Over the next several weeks, I devoured it, becoming increasingly convinced that not only did I want to become an AI researcher, but I specifically wanted to work with Douglas Hofstadter. I had never before felt so strongly about a book or a career choice. At the time, Hofstadter was a professor of computer science at Indiana University, and my quixotic plan was to apply to the computer science PhD program there, arrive, and then persuade Hofstetter to accept me as a student. One minor problem was that I had never taken even one computer science course. I had grown up with computers. My father was a hardware engineer at a 1960s tech startup company, and as a hobby, he built a mainframe computer in our family's den. The refrigerator-sized Sigma-2 machine wore a magnetic button proclaiming, I pray in Fortran. And as a child, I was half convinced that it did, quietly, at night, while the rest of the family was asleep. Growing up in the 1960s and 70s, I learned a bit of each of the popular languages of the day, Fortran, then BASIC, then Pascal, but I knew next to nothing about proper programming techniques, not to mention anything else an incoming computer science graduate student needs to know. To speed along my plan, I quit my teaching job at the end of the school year, moved to Boston, and started taking introductory computer science courses to prepare for my new career. A few months into my new life, I was on the campus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology waiting for a class to begin, and I caught sight of a poster advertising a lecture by Douglas Hofstetter to take place in two days on that very campus. I did a double take. I couldn't believe my good fortune. I went to the lecture, and after a long wait for my turn in a crowd of admirers, I managed to speak to Hofstetter. It turned out he was in the middle of a year-long sabbatical at MIT, after which he was moving from Indiana to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. To make a long story short, after some persistent pursuit on my part, I persuaded Hofstetter to take me on as a research assistant, first for a summer and then for the next six years as a graduate student, after which I graduated with a doctorate in computer science from Michigan. Hofstetter and I have kept in close touch over the years and have had many discussions about AI. He knew of my interest in Google's AI research and was nice enough to invite me to accompany him to the Google meeting. Chess and the First Seed of Doubt the group in the hard-to-locate conference room consisted of about 20 Google engineers, plus Douglas Hofstetter and myself, all of whom were members of various Google AI teams. The meeting started with the usual going around the room and having people introduce themselves. Several noted that their own careers in AI had been spurred by reading GEB at a young age. They were all excited and curious to hear what the legendary Hofstetter would say about AI. Then Hofstetter got up to speak. I have some remarks about AI research in general, and here at Google in particular. His voice became passionate. I am terrified. Terrified. Hofstetter went on. He described how, when he first started working on AI in the 1970s, it was an exciting prospect, but seemed so far from being realized that there was no Danger on the horizon. No sense of it actually happening. Creating machines with human-like intelligence was a profound intellectual adventure, a long-term research project whose fruition, it had been said, lay at least 100 Nobel Prizes away. Hofstetter believed AI was possible in principle. 
quote, the enemy were people like John Searle, Hubert Dreyfus, and other skeptics who were saying it was impossible. They did not understand that a brain is a hunk of matter that obeys physical law, and the computer can simulate anything. The level of neurons, neurotransmitters, etc. In theory, it can be done, unquote. Indeed, Hofstetter's ideas about simulating intelligence at various levels, from neurons to consciousness, were discussed at length in GEB and had been the focus of his own research for decades. But in practice, until recently, it seemed to Hofstetter that general human-level AI had no chance of occurring in his or even his children's lifetime, so he didn't worry much about it. Near the end of GEB, Hofstetter had listed 10 questions and speculations about artificial intelligence. Here's one of them. Will there be chess programs that can beat anyone? Hofstetter's speculation was, no. There may be programs which can beat anyone at chess, but they will not be exclusively chess players. They will be programs of general intelligence. At the Google meeting in 2014, Hofstetter admitted that he had been dead wrong. The rapid improvement in chess programs in the 1980s and 90s had sown the first seed of doubt in his appraisal of AI's short-term prospects. Although the AI pioneer Herbert Simon had predicted in 1957 that a chess program would be world champion within 10 years, by the mid-1970s, when Hofstetter was writing GEB, the best computer chess programs played only at the level of a good but not great amateur. Hofstetter had befriended Elliot Hurst, a chess champion and psychology professor who had written extensively on how human chess experts differ from computer chess programs. Experiments showed that expert human players rely on quick recognition of patterns on the chessboard to decide on a move rather than the extensive brute force look-ahead search that all chess programs use. During a game, the best human players can perceive a configuration of pieces as a particular kind of position that requires a certain kind of strategy. That is, these players can quickly recognize particular configurations and strategies as instances of higher-level concepts. Hurst argued that without such a general ability to perceive patterns and recognize abstract concepts, chess programs would never reach the level of the best humans. Hofstadter was persuaded by Hearst's arguments. However, in the 1980s and 90s, computer chess saw a big jump in improvement, mostly due to the steep increase in computer speed. The best programs still played in a very unhuman way, performing extensive look-ahead to decide on the next move. By the mid-1990s, IBM's Deep Blue machine, with specialized hardware for playing chess, had reached the grand master level, and in 1997, the program defeated the reigning world chess champion, Garry Kasparov, in a six-game match. Chess mastery, once seen as a pinnacle of human intelligence, had succumbed to a brute force approach. Music, the bastion of humanity. Although Deep Blue's win generated a lot of hand-wringing in the press about the rise of intelligent machines, true AI still seemed quite distant. Deep Blue could play chess, but it couldn't do anything else. Hofstetter had been wrong about chess, but he still stood by the other speculations in GEB, especially the one he had listed first. Question. Will a computer ever write beautiful music? Speculation. Yes, but not soon. Hofstetter continued. Music is a language of emotions, and until programs have emotions as complex as ours, there is no way a program will write anything beautiful. There can be forgeries, shallow imitations of the syntax of earlier music, but despite what one might think at first, there is much more to musical expression than can be captured in syntactic rules. To think that we might soon be able to command a pre-programmed, mass-produced, mail-order $20 desk model music box to bring forth from its sterile circuitry pieces which Chopin or Bach might have written had they lived longer 
is a grotesque and shameful misestimation of the depth of the human spirit. Hofstetter described this speculation as one of the most important parts of GEB, I would have staked my life on it. In the mid-1990s, Hofstetter's confidence in his assessment of AI was again shaken, this time quite profoundly, when he encountered a program written by a musician, David Cope. This program was called Experiments in Musical Intelligence, or EMI, which was pronounced ME. Cope, a composer and music professor, had originally developed Emmy to aid him in his own composing process by automatically creating pieces in Cope's specific style. However, Emmy became famous for creating pieces in the style of classical composers, such as Bach and Chopin. Emmy composes by following a large set of rules, developed by Cope, that are meant to capture a general syntax of composition. These rules are applied to copious examples from a particular composer's opus in order to produce a new piece in the style of that composer. Back at our Google meeting, Hofstetter spoke with extraordinary emotion about his encounters with Emmy. I sat down at my piano and I played one of Emmy's mazurkas in the style of Chopin. It didn't sound exactly like Chopin, but it sounded enough like Chopin and like coherent music, that I just felt deeply troubled. Ever since I was a child, music has thrilled me and moved me to the very core. And every piece that I love feels like it's a direct message from the emotional heart of the human being who composed it. It feels like it is giving me access to their innermost soul. And it feels like there is nothing more human in the world than that expression of music. Nothing. The idea that pattern manipulation of the most superficial sort can yield things that sound as if they are coming from a human being's heart is very, very troubling. I was just completely thrown by this. Hofstetter then recounted a lecture he gave at the prestigious Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. After describing Emmy, Hofstetter had asked the Eastman audience, including several music theory and composition faculty, to guess which of two pieces a pianist played for them was a little-known mazurka by Chopin, and which had been composed by Emmy. As one audience member described later, the first mazurka had grace and charm, but not true Chopin degrees of invention and large-scale fluidity. The second was clearly the genuine Chopin, with a lyrical melody, large-scale graceful chromatic modulations, and a natural balanced form. Many of the faculty agreed, and to Hofstetter's shock, voted Emmy for the first piece and real Chopin for the second piece. The correct answers were the reverse. In the Google conference room, Hofstetter paused, peering into our faces. No one said a word. At last, he went on. I was terrified by Emmy. Terrified. I hated it and was extremely threatened by it. It was threatening to destroy what I most cherished about humanity. I think Emmy was the most quintessential example of the fears that I have about artificial intelligence. Google and the Singularity Hofstetter then spoke of his deep ambivalence about what Google itself was trying to accomplish in AI. Self-driving cars, speech recognition, natural language understanding, translation between languages, computer-generated art, music composition, and more. Hofstetter's worries were underlined by Google's embrace of Ray Kurzweil and his vision of the singularity, in which AI, empowered by its ability to improve itself and learn on its own, will quickly reach and then exceed human-level intelligence. Google, it seemed, was doing everything it could to accelerate that vision. While Hofstetter strongly doubted the premise of the singularity, he admitted that Kurzweil's predictions still disturbed him. I was terrified by the scenarios. Very skeptical, but at the same time, I thought, maybe their timescale is off, but maybe they're right. 
we'll be completely caught off guard. We'll think nothing is happening, and all of a sudden, before we know it, computers will be smarter than us. If this actually happens, we will be superseded. We will be relics. We will be left in the dust. Maybe this is going to happen, but I don't want it to happen soon. I don't want my children to be left in the dust. Hofstetter ended his talk with a direct reference to the very Google engineers in that room, all listening intently. I find it very scary, very troubling, very sad. And I find it terrible, horrifying, bizarre, baffling, bewildering that people are rushing ahead blindly and deliriously in creating these things. Why is Hofstetter terrified? I looked around the room. The audience appeared mystified, embarrassed even. To these Google AI researchers, none of this was the least bit terrifying. In fact, it was old news. When Deep Blue beat Kasparov, when Emmy started composing Chopin-like mazurkas, and when Kurzweil wrote his first book on the singularity, many of these engineers had been in high school, probably reading GEB and loving it, even though its AI prognostications were a bit out of date. The reason they were working at Google was precisely to make AI happen, not in a hundred years, but now, as soon as possible. They didn't understand what Hofstetter was so stressed out about. People who work in AI are used to encountering the fears of people outside the field who have presumably been influenced by the many science fiction movies depicting superintelligent machines that turn evil. AI researchers are also familiar with the worries that increasingly sophisticated AI will replace humans in some jobs, that AI applied to big data sets could subvert privacy and enable subtle discrimination, and that ill-understood AI systems allowed to make autonomous decisions have the potential to cause havoc. Hofstetter's terror was in response to something entirely different. It was not about AI becoming too smart, too invasive, too malicious, or even too useful. Instead, he was terrified that intelligence, creativity, emotions, and maybe even consciousness itself would be too easy to produce that what he valued most in humanity would end up being nothing more than a bag of tricks, that a superficial set of brute force algorithms could explain the human spirit. As GEB made abundantly clear, Hofstetter firmly believes that the mind and all its characteristics emerge wholly from the physical substrate of the brain and the rest of the body, along with the body's interaction with the physical world. There is nothing immaterial or incorporeal lurking there. The issue that worries him is really one of complexity. He fears that AI might show us that the human qualities we value are disappointingly simple to mechanize. As Hofstetter explained to me after the meeting, here referring to Chopin, Bach, and other paragons of humanity, if such minds of infinite subtlety and complexity and emotional depth could be trivialized by a small chip, it would destroy my sense of what humanity is about. I am confused. Following Hofstetter's remarks, there was a short discussion in which the nonplussed audience prodded Hofstetter to further explain his fears about AI and about Google in particular. But a communication barrier remained. The meeting continued with project presentations, group discussion, coffee breaks, the usual, none of it really touching on Hofstetter's comments. Close to the end of the meeting, Hofstetter asked the participants for their thoughts about the near-term future of AI. Several of the Google researchers predicted that general human-level AI would likely emerge within the next 30 years, in large part due to Google's own advances on the brain-inspired method of deep learning. I left the meeting scratching my head in confusion. I knew that Hofstadter had been troubled by some of Kurzweil's singularity writings, but I had never before appreciated the degree of his emotion and anxiety. I also had known that Google was pushing hard on AI research, but I was startled by the optimism several people there expressed about how soon AI would reach a general human level. 
My own view had been that AI had progressed a lot in some narrow areas, but was still nowhere close to having the broad general intelligence of humans, and it would not get there in a century, let alone 30 years. And I had thought that people who believed otherwise were vastly underestimating the complexity of human intelligence. I had read Kurzweil's books and had found them largely ridiculous. However, listening to all the comments at the meeting, from people I respected and admired, forced me to critically examine my own views. While assuming that these AI researchers underestimated humans, had I in turn underestimated the power and promise of current day AI? Over the months that followed, I started paying more attention to the discussion surrounding these questions. I started to notice the slew of articles, blog posts, and entire books by prominent people suddenly telling us we should start worrying right now about the perils of superhuman AI. In 2014, the physicist Stephen Hawking proclaimed, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. In the same year, the entrepreneur Elon Musk founder of the Tesla and SpaceX companies, said that artificial intelligence is probably our biggest existential threat, and that, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. Microsoft's co-founder Bill Gates concurred. I agree with Elon Musk and some others on this and don't understand why some people are not concerned. The philosopher Nick Bostrom's book Superintelligence on the potential dangers of machines becoming smarter than humans, became a surprise bestseller, despite its dry and ponderous style. Other prominent thinkers were pushing back. Yes, they said, we should make sure that AI programs are safe and don't risk harming humans. But any reports of near-term superhuman AI are greatly exaggerated. The entrepreneur and activist Mitchell Kapoor advised, Human intelligence is a marvelous, subtle, and poorly understood phenomenon. There is no danger of duplicating it anytime soon. The roboticist and former director of MIT's AI lab, Rodney Brooks, agreed, stating that we grossly overestimate the capabilities of machines, those of today and of the next few decades. The psychologist and AI researcher Gary Marcus went so far as to assert that in the quest to create strong AI, that is, general human-level AI, there has been almost no progress. I could go on and on with dueling quotations. In short, what I found is that the field of AI is in turmoil. Either a huge amount of progress has been made or almost none at all. Either we are within spitting distance of true AI or it is centuries away. AI will solve all our problems, put us all out of a job, destroy the human race, or cheapen our humanity. It's either a noble quest or summoning the demon. What this book is about. This book arose from my attempt to understand the true state of affairs in artificial intelligence, what computers can do now and what we can expect from them over the next decades. Hofstadter's provocative comments at the Google meeting were something of a wake-up call for me, as were the Google researchers' confident responses about AI's near-term future. In the chapters that follow, I try to sort out how far artificial intelligence has come, as well as elucidate its disparate and sometimes conflicting goals. In doing so, I consider how some of the most prominent AI systems actually work, and investigate how successful they are and where their limitations lie. I look at the extent to which computers can now do things that we believe to require high levels of intelligence, beating humans at the most intellectually demanding games, translating between languages, answering complex questions, navigating vehicles in challenging terrain. And I examine how they fare at the things we take for granted the everyday tasks we humans perform without conscious thought, recognizing faces and objects and images, understanding spoken language and written text, and using the most basic common sense. I also try to make sense of the broader questions that have fueled debates about AI since its inception. 
What do we actually mean by general human or even superhuman intelligence? Is current AI close to this level or even on a trajectory to get there? What are the dangers? What aspects of our intelligence do we most cherish? And to what extent would human-level AI challenge how we think about our own humanness? To use Hofstetter's terms, how terrified should we be? This book is not a general survey or history of artificial intelligence. Rather, it is an in-depth exploration of some of the AI methods that probably affect your life, or will soon, as well as the AI efforts that perhaps go furthest in challenging our sense of human uniqueness. My aim is for you to share in my own exploration and, like me, to come away with a clearer sense of what the field has accomplished and how much further there is to go before our machines can argue for their own humanity.